So hello, everybody. I'm very happy to have been invited to this conference on a topic that is, um, well, both frightening and compelling. Uh, it's frightening because it's about technology and technology has always been sort of an enemy for everything that landscape architecture stands for. Uh, a connection, deep connection to the land and vegetation and maybe also uh, history. Um, but it's also an opportunity because we probably need a lot of technology to solve many of the uh, global issues we have with the living on this planet. So I'm also happy to have been invited because um, I'm stepping into a new frontier as a landscape architect for myself. I've I've begun being a very enthusiastic student uh, interested in the art of landscape architecture. And then I became interested in uh, designing within firms, private firms in the Netherlands, design offices and... Um, then I uh, had a big uh, change uh, to become becoming a scientist, which is which is quite hard to do as as a designer and and artist, becoming a scientist and and Udo can tell a lot about that as well. And in that period, I developed this idea of landscape machines that I want to share with you today. Uh, and it's also a celebration of twenty years of landscape machines. But in the past eight years, I've been political advisor because I noticed that being a scientist has its limitations. And I wanted to be, well, I wanted to feel how immediate political involvement, uh, how, how that could change that what needs to change. And I've become rather optimistic. And I also will ex explain a little about that as well. And um, in this moment, I'm stepping to another way of being a landscape architect that is by leading a foundation called Nature College, which, which will probably be much more activist. Activist in between politics, science and art. So, uh, yes, that's when you meet me uh, on this brink of uh, a new way of being a landscape architect. And I wanted to share that with you as well, so you know a little bit about me. Well, um, let me explain a little bit about landscape machines. So in this name... Uh, landscape machine is already the this um, paradox probably it's more of a paradox between opposites so the landscape being something probably very naturalistic and the machine being something very synthetic but that's just how you view uh, machines in general and suppose that in this picture, which is the Ostfona ice cap, suppose that we consider that a machine, a machine of Gaia. So our planet uh, is composed of these kinds of ecosystems that have boundaries in which they exist and then they have a certain form. In this respect, it is a large frozen amount of uh, water and, and minerals. And it acts like a machine because it corresponds to temperature changes and tidal fluctuations. It's a living machine. Um, and I've been inspired with that. I've been inspired as a designer maybe to reproduce these kinds of machines but then with more human elements in them 
agricultural elements and urban elements, but they should be able to function like this ice cap on the planet. And this is also one of the characteristics of landscape machine. It's, it's not a small thing. It's not a machine that you can hold in your hand. It's, it is as large as an ecosystem, but it does involve a kind of technology that is not so much human related as it is planetary related. So that, that's a little introduction about this landscape machine and we'll, we'll dive deeper into that. And one of the earliest uh, illustrations here made by uh, then uh, uh, still a student, now a great landscape architect, uh, Alexander Herbaut, he uh, uh, showed it. Uh, so a landscape machine uh, is, uh, in the top row you can see a succession. It's, just, it's a natural succession of ecosystem development. And as this ecosystem changes, it also change it changes in the way it looks and it changes in vegetation and animal interaction. And in doing so, it uh, allows uh, different mineral minerals entering the system, being changed by the, the system and then uh, become uh, an output in the end. So, uh, if you look at the the input and output scheme below there, you can see that if you have a really great ecosystem, it can also deal with pollutant elements. So you could have as an input polluted water or polluted soil, and then thanks to the well-being of the system, you can uh, change it. You can change from pollution to something that is drinkable or that's livable for birds or fish or uh, uh, things like that. So this is how ecosystems work in general. And this is also how I, as a landscape architect, would like to design them. And then instead of having oil or gas as a, as a fuel, the fuel is actually tidal waves or it's the climate or weather conditions that are there. So that's the, the most fundamental difference between what we normally consider a machine and what we now call here call a landscape machine. So let me introduce in three chapters how I would like to give you uh, some of the lessons of the past 20 years in, in, in designing and researching this. And the first one is about a certain design attitude. And this design attitude has been with us, not only in landscape architecture, but also in landscape related fields for, for hundreds of years. And it's a split identity. So we have a, a problematic relationship between nature and technology. So, and I really like this, this, uh, uh, see if I can yeah, move myself around. I like this image in France of the different uh, aspects, the different attitudes you can have as a designer. So you can be a total fan of, let's say the, the nude, the nude building, the banal building, uh, of modernism and and in the middle, then you can uh, be pseudo-ecological pseudo about it. So, you know, it's not about ecology, but it's uh, sort of a greenwashing. But it happens a lot in, uh, in, in today's landscape architecture. And, and, and on the right, you can see the position of the landscape architect, uh, which is, uh, so it's in the middle of uh, ecology, uh, sorry, in the middle of ecology and um modernity uh it has a little tree a line on top and it has some uh, gardens in in between so these are different standpoints uh, as a designer towards uh what, what what is considered one of the most powerful design elements which is modernism uh, modernity is still uh, our 
the most dominant um, style in which we design. Um, but we, as landscape architects, we have a style of our own as well, and we call that the picturesque. And the picturesque has been here with us since uh, Romantic uh, era. So um, I wouldn't consider landscape architect a very modern profession. I would consider it more of a romantic profession in which the picturesque is um, that which pleases the eye, which is which is also uh, uh, with 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 light and dark uh, artistic depth. Uh, techniques but it's a very static of, uh, way of looking at landscapes you 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 tend to frame certain uh, positions and then make it into a uh, picture uh, but that's quite problematic in today's uh, ecological disaster times let's say look at this image i mean is this a is this a picturesque image you could view like it like that, but then it doesn't have the real message that's inside of it. Huh? This is an image made by a photographer, Bratinsky, and it's one of the most um, toxic places on earth. It's a nickel mine in Canada. And um, this is what we call the Anthropocene. And we cannot view this from a picturesque viewpoint. We have to look at it from a more system uh, perspective and then see that it is not a nice image but it's really a toxic uh, dying earth so how do we deal with that then as designers how do we treat our view as 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 designers towards this kind of uh, system and devastation that's that's the, one of the main reasons uh, i think landscape machine has to offer something and if you look at history it's not the first time that we do that so the whole reason that that uh, picturesque became one of the dominant features for landscape architecture is um, is this change from a more baroque perspective to the romantic perspective in which we were really fascinated for for a long while in, in the 16th, 17th century with dramatic dramatic effects in nature, like, like this uh, thunder uh, and mountain view. And uh, that slowly became uh, romanticized. And this is Caspar David Friedrich's uh, work. And here you, you can clearly see uh, uh, the, the picturesque in effect. Um, and it also involves our imagination, how we want to see the world. So here's this this boy praying uh, to a cross. And then in the background, you see like a mirror image of these trees, uh, sort of a ground building, a castle or a cathedral. And it is the imagination of of people that is just as important as the reality of the planet let's say that that's the typical aspect of of romance but how did how did this romantic view come to be well for europe there was a very distinctive moment in 1755 when the lisbon earthquake happened so lisbon was one of the main cities of europe and it was hit by first an earthquake, total devastation, uh, and this was on a very specific day, the day of uh, uh, having ascension. So uh, um, in the uh, in the Catholic belief, this is where heaven and earth uh, are, are really uh, closest together, and we can pray for our loved ones and 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 all those people who have died and, and especially on this day this dramatic feature happened so it, it felt like uh, God was punishing us um, or, or uh, the, the Lisbons and 
as they went to flee, uh, a large fire broke out. And as this fire broke out, uh, people fled. And then a tsunami also hit them because that, that the earthquake produced this tsunami in the sea. And um, it was up to the church fathers to explain how how can it be that we believe in a God and then still th this punishment? What did we do wrong? And at that very instance, a very young person from Germany, Immanuel Kant, um, he made a radical decision. He said, I don't believe that we can ask God or clerks of God to explain this we need to solve this puzzle for ourselves and he was one of the first to make a geological questionnaire so how, how does how does an earthquake work how does a tsunami come to be how come that uh, especially lisbon is hit and and uh, so all these scientific questions uh, were addressed there so Immanuel Kant, who later became one of the main intellectuals and philosophers for what we now call science and, and knowledge, was affected by this happening. Like you could say, this Lisbon happening is a very early climate happening. It's it's a uh, it's it's just as frightening as all the events that are happening now in, in what we call the Anthropocene. But it was not only Immanuel Kant who made this response, it was also Edmund Burke who made this response. And Edmund Burke was a Scottish uh, politician and he was quite annoyed with the politics of his time. And he said that people had become too far, too remotely related to natural phenomenon and that people were only dealing with economics and and critics and fashion and they lost every connection to the natural sphere and he became interested in the raw natural power or awesomeness or 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 inspiring nature which then became the sublime and from this sublime this romantic era started to uh, grow so again 1755 marked for europe a very early anthropocene catastrophe and there were two uh, very distinctive responses one immanuel kant as the scientist being rational being objective two edmund burke also european but being more romantic, saying it, it needs to be a message that we have become too remote from nature. So romance and science at the same time, like the landscape and the machine, like so it's the same kind of paradox present there. And even that was not the first time, because Edmund Burke coined this term sublime uh, as an in immediate translation from Piri Hypsos, uh, third century Greek or Roman theory, uh, that was also in this at that time and age. So in the third century, uh, Longinus wrote this uh, Piri Hypsos, that is that is later uh, translated as sublime, as a um, uh, as a critique to the society that was too much involved with economics, with fashion, and you know, too much self-absorbed and not in contact with nature or your own uh, human nature, as such. So, it is like a pattern. We are in this pattern behavior, and uh, twenty twenty is probably equal time as the third century and as. Uh, this event in, in the 18th century. So we should learn from that kind of history. And here you can see a map of the Lisbon earthquake. So uh, epicenter in the, in red and then 
how far the waves and uh, reverberations stretch across Europe. So you can see that it was a wake-up call for not only Europe, but the whole world was shaken uh, by this uh, earthquake. And um, due to, let's say, this view on science that we need to know more about geology and tsunamis and uh, everything that happens in, in the natural world, we became obsessed with, um, uh, with, with, oh, sorry, with um, this view on, on separate uh, elements. No, it's getting wrong here. So, so where I am here, you can see uh, all around me, this is the same image as the one uh, on the, on the right, but it's, um, it's how we organize knowledge. We have organized knowledge in all these different um, uh, specializations. So there is a geology apart from medicine, apart from food, apart from, well, you can, you name it, economy, pol politics. And we've learned to understand the world in that way. And we are, I think we are at, at our maximum at the moment. Maybe probably we are, very good at understanding the world and that's that's like the science view but the other view is that it's not alive anymore so the same image is could be alive like a branch from a tree and that's the that's i wouldn't say that's the romantic view but that the the romantic view is a step towards reality you we should be more in contact with not only organizing it in a very human way, but making it actually living a living element, a living system. And that's, that's to me, this is the two worlds that we need to collide. And we don't need to, to be astronauts doing that. So I'm very um, healed to being an astronaut uh, because I, I dream of other worlds that I can visit, but... I can be an astronaut on my own planet. Uh, thanks to this, uh, all this knowledge we have gathered, we are astronauts on, on our own planet. We now start to understand the oceans and the life in it and all the exchange of um, minerals and, and, and climate. Uh, and on the other side, I also... I have a great appeal to not being an astronaut, but being a, a lumberjack, like here. This is not me, but could be. I hope. Well, I'm not so muscular, but um, just being involved with nature um, is is the is the other side of it. So, being knowledgeable and being. Um, involved with nature that's that's how these two opposites can be combined and i think that is what future design should be aiming at it's a combination of a living system and a kind of technology that not destroys the system but is uh, is part of it and uh, we are probably at the momentum in world history that we've reached the, the end of uh, technology as uh, devastating and now we'll be making technology that is actually helpful. So chapter two, that is a great vision that we can be op optimistic, but is it a reality? Well, I think so. I see a few Dutch trends that um, in the in the politics of um, mostly regional, uh, on a regional scale, that also show that we are really able to to make this next step. For instance, this is an image not of the whole Netherlands, but those urban developments that have expanded their uh, uh, their urban. So normally an, an urban situation would be a city, but these cities all lie within a larger landscape field. They have landscape relations. 
with the rivers and the forest and the bogs and the peats and the and the water structures and they are codependent on that and what is striking is that in the in the last 20 years regional planning so so each city with its own metropolitan system landscape system separate from other systems has become dominant instead of uh, a perspective for the Netherlands as a whole. So the Netherlands as a whole has become less dominant and regional scale planning has become more dominant. And in doing so, it has become more embedded in the immediate surroundings. And I think this is a great uh, example of, of uh, why we can be optimistic. And um, one of the main drivers is to have a more local food system. And and uh, in the same time span as I was talking about with Edmund Burke and uh, Immanuel Kant, there was this uh, amateur economist, von Thunen, who explored this idea of a city with, uh, with, a, with a certain logic of... Um, food being produced uh, so the 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 further away the longer it should be able to be preserved and in in this kind of thinking this is uh, renewed today to be less um, dependent on global markets and more dependent on regional market systems and this is one of the later on uh, under my commission made uh, images of, let's say, uh, a beer and cider factory, uh, because we can make these beverages just in, a, in the vicinity of our own cities. We we don't need to be dependent on, on any global uh, scale for that. So we can produce cider and beer in our surroundings. Um, and this is the city of Utrecht, which is uh, about the same as uh, Frankfurt uh, region. And we started investigating, and so as a political advisor, I did this, into this white zone, this white zone in between the city and all the uh, suburbs and, and uh, little villages surrounding that. So what is, what is the shared perspective on the landscape that these cities uh, share huh? with, with, with the whole... Um, daily urban system and it and it expanded it expanded beyond this white zone towards um, the blue zone all the river systems that bring life and uh, and bring also connections to different parts of the netherlands so this became the backbone of the the landscape met uh, metropolitan view on how urban life and landscape uh, together uh, make uh, a, live, a living living system. And behind it is uh, also a very optimistic perspective is this different view on economics. economics. So this is the donut eco uh, economy, a model of it by Kate Rayworth, that has on the outside the planetary boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. So if you if you go beyond the outer boundaries, then the planetary system will um, respond and collapse. And on the inside, you have the social development goals, and there you shouldn't you shouldn't go below a certain uh, uh, point because then uh, people will start uh, being neglected and um, negatively involved. And another very optimistic uh, view is that nature uh, is healthy. What a surprise. But it is, and um, the uh, amount of evidence is increasing. So try nature and be healthy. This is a, this is a very uh, uh, optimistic and uh, strong message that is reaching more and more people. And another optimistic aspect is that, yes, we, sh we should have more solar and wind uh, energy and we can now move beyond the very boring um, 
technical elements right from the factory and make a place where you can uh, you you want to marry well in this image it's not possible but um i've installed a design competition that made e uh, better and better examples of how you can have solar panels and at the same time have large areas for water storage and uh, biotope uh, development for water birds and um, migration routes. So here you find that technology is not, sh shouldn't be as pure as, as here, but can be integrated. And it, it's almost a marriage between the romantic aspect and, this, and the science aspect. So here I have reasons to become optimistic again. And here the same. Uh, this is a different way of uh, collecting energy, more kinetic energy by moving poles, because it's a it's a it's a peat land, and this peat is always uh, it's unstable ground, and therefore you, we can have wildernesses and energy production at the same time. And in this area where that is applicable. Um, which is a large uh, agricultural area in this in this neighborhood of uh, what I showed you, this urban metropolitan system, then if you know that your energy is from there, you can have this connection with your phone or with, with internet, knowing where your energy is from, and at the same time knowing that uh, it, probably even more energy will also produce more wilderness because that has this... Uh, economic relation so here you can have a connection between living in the downtown urban parts and and still have a connection with the land because it's energy that is flowing in between and here you see a series of maps uh, one of the larger um, um, problems for the Utrecht metropolitan area, which is soil deprivation. So 1950, this is uh, the urbanity. And in the, in the light colors, you can see how uh, uh, the more colored it becomes, the, the deeper the soil is uh, sinking. Huh? So the soil is um, eaten away. Um, and this is so problematic because it changes our whole water system and in uh, in a future perspective uh, we um, we don't have soil anymore to store uh, water so in this in this science view on the landscape we can see that that landscape is not static landscape is something that is that is changing it's going back and forth or well it's going in time is developing and we need this kind of information science and uh, probably also artificial intelligence to deal with this kind of dynamic interaction so i'm very optimistic uh, uh, on on one side of the technology that we now have to monitor this this kind of big problem of soil deprivation and and water storage that we can try to understand it as from an astronaut point of view. And at the same time, we can have uh, all kinds of new agricultural um, means how we can respond to that. Because if, 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 if it will become wetter, uh, the cows can no longer be there. It, it should be a different kind of vegetation for agricultural uh, development. Um, and that means a lot of exploration to be done, huh? like the lumberjack or here uh, a different types type of farming. And for me, it's so it's optimistic that we can at the same time have more technological view on the landscape because we know how it changes and we should change our own behavior into those kinds of um interactions involvements that are much more physical and uh, adventurous than than we do now so i'm i'm very hopeful that people will will be uh, more involved in that
and this is one of the most beautiful maps uh, I, I know this is not the Utrecht uh, region it's a uh, it's a fictive map of Manhattan and you can see here well the whole of Manhattan is 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 of course urbanized but if the landscape changes uh, it will one at one point in time it will probably become an archipelago again and in doing so in this change that will happen we need to become explorers astronauts of our own planet again and for me this is uh, more optimistic than pessimistic in a way okay chapter three what did i learn from well one of the design attitudes that i've uh, been developing with students for 20 years there's lessons to be learned there uh, so this is the image of the landscape machine and now maybe you can understand it better now so there is a certain succession in the landscape could be soil uh, depletion could be that the water table will go up and archipelagos will exist so there is a rapidly changing environment and we should now learn to adapt to that and by adapting we can uh, also develop a new kind of technique which is which is go going with the flow going with the natural systems and the first steps towards that is is in fact reverse from what i've always learned as a landscape architect so as a landscape architect i've i've learned that everything is landscape but in designing landscape machines we reverse that we say well landscape is actually where you protect it to be so here in this artist uh, project uh, you can see that there is a cage and in this cage there is landscape outside the cage there is this urbanity and at the moment that is the position for a landscape architect we first should consider a boundary and within this boundary we can have a natural system and we can use the, the natural technologies. And outside of that is still the, let's say, the old world that will probably also have to change. But our testing grounds are within this boundary. And a great example is uh, of a former student, uh, Thijs de Zee, who has been exploring a little part of the harbor in Amsterdam, where he wanted to make a park for the eel. So the eel is, is a fish. Huh? And what he did is uh, inside this basin, he designed these, let's say, homes, homes for the eels. Uh, and these are strange metal cages. And these cages, they probably offer opportunities for the eel to, to be there more protective or uh, with, with the less uh, current uh, coming in. Uh, but we don't know for sure. So this is this is really like being an astronaut on a on a strange planet, huh? So you introduce this element, which is actually a strange element. So I, I, I've named this uh, Fremdkörper, which is uh, probably a term you 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 know better in uh, in in Germany, a f strange element, and then you put a certain amount of stress onto the system. So by putting this element in. Uh, there will be change of currents, there will be change of behavior of uh, fish. It, actually, it is a kind of stress you put, put on the system, but the stress helps to liven up the level of natural interactions. It will liven up biodiversity and interactions. So stress, what we learned in the, in, in the landscape machine idea is that stress isn't always negative. Stress is a way to have more diversity. So by introducing these Fremdkörper, which is not in the whole of the harbor of, uh, of, of Amsterdam, but only in small parts. So small parts, relatively small Fremdkörper, and then learn from the interaction that uh, exists. The interesting social aspect is that people 
are curious. So here you see a bunch of astronauts, let's call them astronauts, they are divers, and they are from different uh, fields. So there's politicians, there's designers, there's people, technicians, and they are all curious to see how this works. So by doing this experiment, you also bind a group of people within this shared experience and shared involvement. So this is also the result of a great design intervention. It is ex actually the same as what I showed you earlier. In the 17th century, we learned to look at natural phenomenon and be in awe, inspired by it. So there's not so much different between this and that, only here it was painters and here it's a designer doing that. Okay, so that's the first lesson. Second lesson is we should really say goodbye to the picturesque. So on the left, you see a monoculture agricultural field and many people really like that. They like the open view, the, the regulated fields. They like the rhythm of it. They like the, well, certain um, freedom. But if we want to interact more with complex systems, then the picture will also be more complex. So moving from that to permaculture and to uh, polyculture, it will become a messy image. So we should really say goodbye to the picturesque and um, we should welcome a certain level of chaos. And it's, um, it's a regenerative view of the world. It's a changing dynamic view of the world instead of preserving only one specific uh, image of it, one specific picture. So this is a hard lesson. Many designers don't like it. They have no control over the final outcome and they have even fear that their clients will not accept it. So yes, it's one of the hard struggles we have to deal with as designers and as clients. Then returning to this image, what do we mean by uh, intelligence? What, what do we mean by technique? Well, I think if we embrace succession as a technique, we should reframe it not as synthetic technique, but as natural technique, natural intelligence, nature technology. So by following a natural succession, we also have a natural intelligence in the system. And this natural intelligence is... Um, brought by vegetation, by animals. So we should be much more in contact and in conversation with vegetation, with animals, probably even up to the rights of animals and the rights of nature. So this is uh, another lesson from the landscape machine idea. If we consider natural intelligence, we should also have more room for that kind of natural intelligence and consider it equal to human intelligence. Another lesson is, uh, this is from an example designed in uh, 2012, where there is a, a, a river and, a, and a, a dike and then there's houses and they have actually no connection to each other. They exist there. And if you want to have a more dynamic interaction, you can design an, an, a breakthrough, to, a break through the dike, have a more interaction. And here you see the cage again. Eh? So you see that there is only a small patch of landscape that is surrounded by this uh, secondary dike in which the natural system has more freedom. So this is this typical first step to what uh, a landscape machine. Um, but the lesson here is that the technique we use for this is super simple. It's 
it's just old fashioned engineering with with earth uh and and maybe with a little technology in the sluice door so in the doors opening and closing but it's actually a technology that has been with us for hundreds of years so it's not very high end it's rather low end technology and the result also is very much uh, a low end technology as well it's about vegetation that will grow there and and um different kind of animal relationship so it's it's a kind of well i would like to call it a native technique so like the indigenous techniques in, in those parts of the world that still have indigenous people we in the west in the netherlands in in europe we can have native techniques as well that are very simple and that uh, enable to um, uh, explore uh, the possibilities of a more dynamic relationship with the, within the landscape. And still a deeper lesson within that, this is the same uh, image, it's the same cross-section. Uh, you see here the water and, and the levee and the land. And if you introduce these chambers of um, natural dynamics, you see that there is there is something you do. Uh, so so making this dike is the intention, is your scripted intervention. So you can hire a contract for that. You can you can have uh, finance for that. But after that, after that, you don't know what happens. So there's a scripted design intervention, which is, which is the dike, and then you have the landscape system that responds to it, which is an unscripted response. So this is a very important distinction. There's a distinction between what, as a designer, you can control and what in 20, 30 years development period you cannot control. You should just be very open and um inquisitive about uh so here you have it patches of scripted and unscripted uh, interventions and then it becomes very important that you monitor the development of this scripted and unscripted uh, developments and it will change within a year it will change due to seasons and in this case there is a boat coming in and and uh, making large currents um so there's there's all kinds of um rhythms and there's all kinds of um it's like a musical piece so we should be interested in the development of that and this is something we can do as landscape architects and it's it's very but it's very important that someone monitors keeps track of that and this is something we as designers don't do so we design it but then we don't monitor ourselves so here here's probably a very important political governmental uh, responsibility that we should address and even uh, in doing that in monitoring we should have a very good bookkeeping and a way to monitor all kinds of flows. So there's a great knowledge in system technologies that um, include different flows of different elements. And um, yeah, I think we should, we, we probably will need a lot of technology and even artificial technology to become better and smarter with this but it's it, it's a necessity a metabolism bookkeeping so to conclude uh, there were there were three chapters the first chapter was about a design attitude that has been there for a few hundred years so we have since renaissance times been at one one moment romantic and at the other moment very realistic in science this is not a new paradox it is 
the remaining paradox. And it, from this paradox, you can make something beautiful. Um, and you shouldn't um, try to choose between one or the other. And in chapter two, I explored how in the Netherlands, the current political situation is actually very optimistic and, and driving this new balance between technology and and romantic uh, views on it. And um, in the third chapter, I explained one of the of a list of lessons learned from 20 years of landscape machine design. And these lessons are really um, well uh, for us. There have been, there have been um, breakthroughs and I hope that I've been able to share it with you. So co concluding to cyborg landscapes, <clears throat> I think a cyborg landscape is, is a technological landscape and we, we need probably this blend of a uh, very advanced technology for the bookkeeping we need to do, the monitoring, um, certain artificial intelligences to deal with super complexity. But at the same time, it's a, it's a very old fashioned and romantic technique of our human involvement, which, which involve our hands and our bodies and our social communities to deal with that. So since that, that has been the driving element for millennia in humankind. We we can just keep on doing that, uh, and we will we will get better and better. That's the optimistic view, and um, I'm very happy to see that the political agenda is moving towards that, and it's it's less on a national scale and more on a regional scale, and on a regional scale becomes very concrete and comprehensive and it will have to do with food systems that are closer by the cities um, and natural developments as places where food uh, can also be harvested so there's there's no need to make a distinction between agriculture and natural areas they can be one and the same area so the lessons i have the most important lessons probably also for academia is that we should not lose sight of how we as humans and, and human beings should be involved in this system. And this system is, uh, is about uh, retrofitting. It's, it's a lot about very simple low-tech techniques that we should be exploring. So that's, that's one of the main challenges the other is um, we should try and test on a on a somewhat smaller scale fremdkörper elements and and be very curious to see how nature uh, responds to that and learn from that so this is our learning phase fremdkörper help us to introduce a certain kind of stress to a system and then learn from that and lastly probably the most um difficult one is we should really s regard nature as equal to human beings so we should really invest in, in what some call post-humanistic design the rights of nature um, and plant life and animal life as equal to human beings and and this is quite a quite a drastic change uh, i expect so i thank you very much and if you want to explore this with me. You are very welcome. Thank you for listening.